Now, now Mr. Gismondi will give a brief uh, synopsis of what all of this is about. Sapper is coming. Finalmente, grazie. <laughs> now, if you like it, uh, Lightfield is a book written by Paolo Inghilleri. If somebody like to, to know some things about uh, Lightfield, uh, call Artemide, please, in the United States, and uh, you will have the book. Metamorphosy. We understand uh, the center of the problem is not the object, is not the, the lighting fixture, is uh, the welfare of the man, is uh, the feeling well of the man, is uh, our life, uh, is uh, to live uh, in one atmosphere. We understand and we try to do the machine. The machine is uh, very simple, is uh, to use the color and to make a mix of the color, but not only a color, one color, because if you try to live in a room with only red light or blue light is terrible. We, we need to have light, color light, but in stratification. Did you see is that the color is changing from the top to the, the other parts uh, have to be stratified. And uh, now I show to you what is the machine. Boop. But funziona. The machine is not working. My dear, what do you have to do? <laughs> Finito. <laughs> 24, the number after the 24 slides. We change the program a little. <laughs> this is the reason. <laughs> Ready? No? Try. Not yet? Oh, bene, metamorphosis. Okay, what, what is our solution of the problem? The solution is to use three fundamental colors, red, blue, and green, with a very special filter who are able to do this uh, type of light, this is stratification. We, the three color together make the white light. And uh, we have also one other, the only white. The reason is because if we need more light in the room, it's better to have an help made by one uh, white uh, projector. We use a computer, the computer, who is able to change, to make uh, the different atmosphere. The other one is the receptor, and the telecomando is there. Cosa c'è? This is the system, the technical system. It's very easy to understand what is this. And uh, at this moment, uh, it was uh, important uh, to have the machinery working, this uh, uh, system is able to do almost 20 million of different atmosphere. We decided to, to make uh, this uh, microprocessor, who is able to have uh, 12 atmosphere designed by somebody. And uh, to have uh, a million, it's your choice. And then the other most important things is uh, it's possible to, to change this, to repeat, and uh, to memorize. It means, if you like, to make one special atmosphere for you, for a time of your life, you, make, uh, you memorize this one. But after, after the, the system, the machine, we have to make really a lighting fixture. Artemide Cold is uh, the usual professional designers, and they made this uh, different uh, type of uh, light in fixture. This is uh, designed by Michele De Lucchi. After you explain why. This is a Richard Sapper suspension, fantastic. This is a Wettestein, uh, Switzerland designer. Me, Nicoline is a different uh, solution. It's changes, uh, 
is very nice. This is made by Aldo Rossi, one of the most important architects and designers in Italy. This is made by Carlotta de Bevilacqua, here. She's architect but also designer. This is one, what is the name of this? Santa Chiara, Denis Santa Chiara, sorry. Andrea Branzi. And me, the best designer in the world. <laughs> You understand, I am the boss and I take the decision <laughs> also to, do, to be in competition with the real best designer in the world, but uh, it's like this. And we made, I made also some different solution. <laughs> Finito, no more. Perfetto. Grazie. And uh, now, uh, what is your program? Grazie. Ah, uh, uh, I, I like to show to you what is the season. Sorry, oh, okay. I forget it. C'è tempo? Okay, quickly. Sì. Quickly, quick, very fast. This is uh, one. Uh, this is one of the 12 colors who are memorized. Vulcan. Oh, I have to read what is the name. Eh? Archip no, Borealis, number two, the number three is uh, Oasis, the number four is uh, Sideral, down is uh, in the morning, early morning, Sunset is, uh, is like Sunset Boulevard, is okay, <laughs> this is uh, Sahara, very hot, if you are uh, depressing, in depression, this is good. Uh, this is uh, Nilo. Nilo is a river in uh, Egypt. Nine is uh, archipelago. Ten is uh, Rubino. Eleven is Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean uh, color. <laughs> and the twelve is Ireland. Ireland is green. Sure. <laughs> now. We try, for example, to, to do one other different. For example, we put the 15 is one of the other, is a full color. And now we push the white and we reduce the white lamp. You stay in your, uh, in your bed, or you prefer, and you change. It's very easy. Did you see I am reducing the white? Now white is zero, is the three colors. And now we take, I take the green. I don't like the green and I reduce the green. Take time because I have to go slowly because it's 12 million. Did you see it's changing? The green and after Red is not n more in fashion now, and uh, I changed red. Yeah, red is, uh, and the red is coming down, down, down. Finito. Finito, it means uh, now red is at 28%, the green is 12%, and the blue is 100%. I reduce a little blue, but just... Uh, No, it's better, right? Ho finito, eh? Yes, Hai finito. finito. Hai finito, ok? Yes, finito. Thank you. Now for Richard Sapper, who has been called the best designer in the world. Is it possible after? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't see anything of you. I don't know why, but, well, anyway, we see the light here. I think um, we just had a very, very uh, clear demonstration of the possibilities of this 
of this system, which really puts us into a position where we can do things with light which we have never been able to do before. And uh, I think that we probably do not know yet very well where this can all lead to, but it is certainly a very interesting technology. I, <clears throat> we have seen and heard a lot about this light, and I thought that maybe you would be interested in knowing why these different solutions that have been proposed for this metamorphosis lighting system look so different and look the way they look. I naturally cannot speak for my colleagues, but I have tried to think about why my solution looks the way it looks, which is a, a, a question that is not so easy to answer as you might think, because uh, usually, at least myself, but I think most designers make those decisions not in a conscious way, but in, a, in an unconscious way. And if afterwards they, they shall explain why like this and not like that, they usually are in trouble, at least I usually am. Now, in this case, I have tried to, to find out why just this sort of strange shape of a, of a pyramid standing on its head. And I will try shortly to explain this a little bit to you, because it might shed some light on the on the reasons why some designs and some products look the way they look. First of all, I must say that the, <clears throat> the, the form that this lamp now has is not its original form because originally this was only a version of the lamp and the, the, main, the main application of this principle was on a lamp standing on the floor. And this uh, but this version has then, out, at least up to now, has not been put into production, and we have only a lamp that's hanging from the ceiling. But it really makes only sense when you can have it in two, in two versions, one from the ceiling and one from the floor. Anyway, in, when a designer or myself, let me speak about myself personally, when I think of a new, of a new form, there can be two things can happen. Either I can uh, invent something completely new that I have never done before in that way, or, and this is, happens more frequently, I think in families of, of uh, designs. That means that when I work on a form, this form usually has had in my head, or also in my personal history, predecessors and forerunners. And exactly like a painter who develops a certain way of painting, of making paintings over several, several works, so also I usually develop a, th a theme over several products and several of my projects. And sometimes these developments go over many, many years. And I thought that maybe it would be interesting for, for, for you to see what some of these, of these evolving themes, which I will show with very, very few slides. One of the themes that has always interested me, and here I have to say that this is a particularly uh, poignant case to, to, to show this because the metamorphosis has been one of the themes that have most interested me in all my work. And where, whereas in this particular project, the metamorphosis takes place just in the light, but not in the form, I have been, in other works of myself, been very interested in the metamorphosis of the form. And I will show you 
show you some examples of that. I also have been interested in experimenting other families of forms which are related to this. And one is the concept of movement, which is related to the metamorphosis. And another is the concept of a, of a clean geometric form, which is also related and makes, for me, sense only together with this concept of metamorphosis of the form. The concept of movement has been one of the, the things that has interested me from the very beginning of my activity. And I will show you here now, if I can find it, and if it comes, a slide of a watch, which is the oldest product that I have designed that is still in production. I designed this table clock when I was 27 years old, and it is in production since 1960. So you can buy still this clock in Italy, and you will say it's been in continuous production for 28 years. It, um, you will say, what is, what is moving here? What is the concept of movement? It is very simple. This clock could not normally stand because it would be supposed to fall down. But it has counterweight in its back, and so that keeps it in its position as you see it on this picture. If you kick it over, it will start to dance on the table and roll around, and at the end it will stand up like one of those uh, Chinese dolls that stand up. So this was the first time that I have experimented with a form in movement. And this then has evolved into something else. This is one of the earliest designs that I did with Marco Zanuso. And it is a very, in Italy, a very well-known little transistor radio, which is the first case where we together tried this concept of metamorphosis. Because if you don't use the radio, it looks like this. If you use it, it looks like this, because you can open it up. And this thing has really two faces that are in contrast to each other. And this sort of metamorphosis has always intrigued me very much. We then tried something else. And this is a telephone. And also the telephone opens up and becomes, has this, uh, this feature of a metamorphosis. Or here, this is a television set, which doesn't look like a television set. It looks like a cube. It is called black, and this is also a very well-known product. Only, only if you light it up, you see that it is a television set. This is the same thing seen from above. These are all designs of the 60s, very old. But in this uh, black television set, the first time I have tried out to make a completely geometric form, because this thing is absolutely geometrically pure. And the metamorphosis here is only appearing in the image of the screen. This is another, another form in movement, which you probably know. And this is another of the boxes that open and close. This was another radio, which is very little known. And this is one of a, this is the first digital stopwatch that was ever built. And here I tried again this concept of a form that can, is different when it is not in use from when it is in use. 
This is when you open it. When you have it in your hand. And this is a, this is a, what do you call this? A denect or something like that. Also this folds and becomes flat. Here you have uh, a scooter. And this is a folding easy chair. And you can hang it on the wall. <laughs> and it has a little hook which can hide in the backrest. This is a secretaire, which not only opens up, but it also can adjust its height so that you can work on it standing or sitting. And here you see again the concept of a form that can change. This is the first, the first laptop of IBM. By the way, I have, I have learned with surprise that I do not work for IBM anymore. Until this morning I did, and uh, so this was news to me. By the way, I have never been a design director of IBM. I am since 1980 a design consultant to IBM. And this machine here, which for us today looks almost like antique, so old it is, but it's not so terribly old. It's just 19, it's just, it's about 10 years old. For a computer, this is almost unthinkable. This, uh, this machine I did in this particular form because IBM has development labs all over the world. And at that time, the development lab for for mobile computers, for all personal computers, was in Boca Raton in Florida. And every time I came to Boca Raton, I, got, I found as a present on my table a little crocodile. Because the people of the design center there, they looked at the markets or in shops or so, if they could find a tin crocodile or a, or a, or a, or a uh, rubber crocodile or something like this, and they always gave me that crocodile because there are so many alligators in this area, and they found that this was funny. And I, when I was looking for a form to give to this to this uh, <clears throat> laptop, I thought I should make it look a little bit like a crocodile, <laughs> so that you can you can see here the the teeth, the teeth of the keyboard. And you can see how it opens its mouth. This is again the same machine. And this is, uh, and this is um, a machine which is the successor to this convertible. And this is the ThinkPad, the IBM ThinkPad. And it goes back to my stopwatch that I showed you before. Here, I tried, again, this concept of metamorphosis, where I have a form that is as pure and clean as possible, and which does not show what is inside. This is just a box that should, could be a box of cigars. It doesn't really denounce its nature. Only when you open it, then you find out what it really is. And this machine is now uh, produced since four or five years, I think. And it can be considered one of the examples where design is also a good business. I am not usually a man who can, who sustains that always good design is good business because 
There are so many ugly things on the market that prove the contrary. But in this case, I think it is. This, of this machine last year, IBM sold 1,200,000, and it generated three and a half billion dollars of revenue and one billion dollars of profit for IBM. So it is one of them, certainly one of the most sold products that I have ever designed. This is, uh, shows some of the, in, of the changes that we made from one year to the next in this, in this machine. The one to the right was the original. And all the, per, all the components that have to be able to be loaded into this machine are loaded through the side walls. So the side walls are really looking like uh, a succession of garage doors and through each of these garage doors, you can introduce one or the other component. And then in the next year, we changed this completely. We just made the keyboard so that you can lift it. And now you, this thing is like a suitcase. You open the keyboard, and then you drop all the components in. But the form, the exterior form, was completely unchanged. This is now... Uh, a product that is not yet in unlimited production. This is an, also a computer, but a computer that can be written on and a computer that can read. And you can also here have it in different configurations and forms. And you can have it sideways or top ways, and this is a little bit of a glance into the future because we do not have yet the software that is, that is uh, working well enough to really use such a machine without a keyboard. So I just wanted to show you a little bit the background of a form that then gets, becomes, for instance, a pyramid and becomes a lamp. But the formal idea behind it goes from one product to the next. There would be a lot to say about the way such <coughs> projects can evolve in an industry and cannot evolve in another industry, because this is really the most difficult part of the work of a designer, is not to create a form, but to have this form then translated into a product. A product, in this case, being like a creature, because as long as it is a model, that's one thing, but to make an industrial product out of it is something completely different and this has to be done in cooperation with a client, and there you need the right relation with the client. And this is where Italian industry is really one step ahead of many others, because Italian industry can understand what the right atmosphere is and what the right, the right relations are to make such a thing possible. And certainly, Artemide is a very good example of that. And I would like to discuss this maybe with my colleagues and Mr. Gismondi in a little circle here. OK, so the panelists will come up to the podium. <laughs> While the panelists are settling on the podium, um, think about some questions that you might want to ask, and if you like, come up and um, I will give you the microphone and so that the, they can tape you.
before everybody settles down, I'd like to ask Mr. Gismondi a question. You. Um, how many TTOs did you sell? 2.5 million, more than IBM. I'd like to ask Mr. Sapper a question. How much money did you make on that TTO? Not enough. That's not good enough. I don't know. actually deal with a per piece profit on its sales. Sapper. If I would get a royalty on computers, I probably would not sit here, but, <laughs> but in my yacht in the Caribbean. So a royalty is more profitable rather than getting a band. Well, that depends how you sell. Uh, Mr. Gis okay, let's hear Mr. Gismondi's relationship, please. Please pay attention. Uh, <laughs> your your uh, fee structure with your designers. What is your what is your um, agreement with your designers? How do you work with them? Do they get an upfront fee, or do they get royalties? How do you work with your designers? Selling boat, we suffer, we made many regatta, we went to ski with this friend, with the other friend. This is very important because the connection between designer and the company has to be friendly. We have to have uh, the pleasure to say, your product is a garbage, please go. <laughs> we pay royalties, only royalties. And everybody take a risk, the company and the designer. If he, is, uh, or he likes to design always Tizio. And uh, also for our TV, it is a good, uh, <laughs> it's a good be deal. How do you choose your designer, the designers that you work with, this group in particular? What, what was the reason you chose for the metamorphosis? What was the reason you chose ah, this particular group? One choice is uh, very, very important uh, is uh, my wife. Uh, she is <laughs> <laughs> architect and uh, she is working with me and uh, he made one uh, lamp. She, what I said? Ah, excuse me. <laughs> but I can, I can respond to this question too. Bravo. Okay. Because um, I remember very well how I met Mr. Gismondi. Why are you Mr. today? <laughs> <laughs> Ernesto. Ernesto. Bravo. Ernie, Ernesto. Like. Ernie. <laughs> I told you before, I showed you this, this, uh, this clock that was my first product that uh, is static is the name of this clock that I showed, the first slide that I showed. At that time, when I was really a kid still, and I was, had just more or less arrived in Italy, I was working in a, de in the, in a department store. And this uh, department store was very famous. It's La Rinascente, still exists. And at that time, they had a, they had a project office that would uh, develop products that then uh, would be sold in the department store under their trademark. And they had kids from all over the world, very badly paid, to, to, to sit in this uh, project office and design, and design these products. And we had, naturally, we had a lot of fun doing this. And a few rooms further down the corridor was the office of the Compasso d'Oro, which is the very famous Italian design award. And um, one day, the secretary of the Compasso d'Oro appeared in our studio, in our design studio, and she asked me, if I would like to design a clock. And I said, why? And she said, well, there is a man who has just telephoned. He has a clock factory, and he's very furious because he sent his clocks to the Compasodoro, but he didn't win any award. And so he asked me what he should do to win the Compasodoro. 
And I said, well, first of all, you should get a good designer. And he said, well, could you tell me one? And she said, he must have had some interest in me, I think. <laughs> she, said, um, <clears throat> she said, yes, yes, I could, I could tell you one. And then she ran to me and asked me if I would design the clock. So I ran back with her to her office. The man was still on the phone. And, um, and, I, and we made an appointment. And so I went to this guy, and he said uh, to me, can you design for me a clock that wins the Compasadoro? <laughs> and I said, well, but I can't promise you, but I can try. <laughs> and so I got the commission to design this clock, which won the Compasadoro. Right. So, <clears throat> so after that, naturally, I was a big hero with this guy. And I offered him the next design, which was another clock. And this idiot wouldn't produce it. <laughs> he, would, uh, he would say, well, this costs too much in tooling, and uh, I don't know. Well, evidently he was just interested in winning the Compostadoro, and then his interest in design had vanished. And so I had this I had this clock in my, this design, this uh, model of this clock in my drawer. It was sitting there for a few years. And then one day, I don't now remember why, but one day I happened in your office. And, and you asked me, do you have something that I could produce? And I thought of this clock, and I thought, yes, maybe I have something. And so I brought this clock to you, and Ernesto made the clock. And the, its name is Tantalo, oh. and it was produced for many years. Now it isn't produced anymore, but it was produced for many years. And this was an, a clock that originally I had made for somebody else. So this is how we got together. But it tried May I tell to... my story? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, I, I met Ernesto in... Uh, 1979 in Triennale of Milan. Well, Triennale in Milano is, a, is a, 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 an exhibition that happens every three years about design and about uh, uh, environmental um, solutions and, uh, and so on. And uh, in 1979, I, I, I designed very strange uh, householders. And, mm -hmm. uh, just the day after the opening, Ernesto called me and he told me, did you use that strange household old, in, uh, in Triennale? Well, forget it and come to design something for me. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember I went, I was very young and very emotional. And I went with uh, a lamp, it was a square lamp. Uh, I, I brought this lamp and I said, this, this for me is a, is a nice lamp. and. Uh, Explain, and I try to 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 convince him uh, how beautiful was this square lamp. After three months, uh, this lamp was in production, round. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, the, I mean, it's, uh, it's not a joke. It's true, and uh, I, I I have the drawing, and I can show that it's a reality. But this express, if you want, uh, uh, my, my approach to design. That uh, is not only to design, to express something that belongs to myself, but is uh, to, to deal with the company and to try to, um, to understand uh, which is uh, the, best, uh, the best relation and the best combination of interest between a designer and a company. Uh, I, I believe that the, the design today as a, as a discipline, as a, an institution, as a very important roles in the society. And uh, for the designer, it's not such important to design only the shape, but it's also to, to try to get in touch with the real problem of the industry, the real problem of technology, and to, to try to find solutions that uh, sometime can go over the, the shape and the, just the, the form of the object. So, uh, uh, for example, j just as mm. short, uh, just to tell you, uh, when I did... Try to explain yeah. Memphis. 
this. No, no, I, I want to tell you about Ptolemeo that you know. This lamp I did for, for Artemis. Uh, I did the Ptolemeo for Artemide, and uh, the first uh, prototypes was very, very desolating because it uh, was not standing at all. It was always, the lamp was always collapsing. <laughs> and with, uh, we had this prototype on the table, I think, for six, seven months. And uh, suddenly, uh, one, one guy in the company came and uh, he, he changed the, the small wheels uh, that are um, uh, turning the, the spring. In the, and instead of to put uh, aluminum wheels, he put uh, uh, nylon wheels. And with the nylon wheels, the, the Ptolemy was working. So you, you understand also how fragile is uh, the capability of the designer when it's uh, just uh, such a, a small detail that they can change the possibility to, to do a lamp and the possibility to do also such a success as Ptolemy was. Okay, now try to explain Memphis, please. <laughs> About Memphis? Explain, explain Memphis, Ernesto. Memphis, uh, no, he, he. he will. Okay. Memphis was a, a, a was a very interesting approach. You know, as Ettore Sotsas used to say at the time, Memphis is not a is not a company where the design is at the service of the company, but uh, is a, is a company that is a service for the designer. So uh, that changed completely the, the <coughs> relations with the, with the company. Uh, Memphis was not. Uh, uh, I never got a brief from Artemide, from uh, Memphis, and, uh, and Memphis was a, a totally free way to design something, uh, and to design something with the only problem to do something really uh, belonging to the time, belonging to the time in which it was done. And Memphis was something of the 80s, obviously. Uh, Memphis, in my opinion, was very important because uh, express uh, the idea that design is communication and that through design, through very simple objects like tables, chairs, uh, sofas, uh, lamps, you, you can in some way uh, design the spirit, the, the aim of your time. And, um, and that uh, you can communicate a lot through the world, uh, especially in, in, in a positive way as, as Memphis did. What does Richard Sapper think of Memphis? Ooh, well, about the same thing. Memphis was an absolutely fantastic experience and a fantastic adventure into, into, uh, into a completely new world. The one thing that uh, somehow Memphis never managed to do was the, to, let's say, to reconcile this fact of being a company at the service of the designer with the, with the sales part of a company which usually works just the other way around. So this in, uh, I think that this in, in Memphis has never been brought to, to, to a real conclusion, this, this uh, dialogue. What do, you was, say, uh, people, what do you say to people who say that Memphis was a wrong direction for design to take, that it was a mistake? To me? To any one of you. Well, Memphis, that, it why, didn't, why? that it didn't go anywhere, that it didn't take design the next step. It did take design the next step. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a school of opinion that says that it was a dead end. Yeah, well, naturally there are schools of opinions about everything, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But this is, I don't think, is not pertinent here. The problem of, if there is a problem with Memphis, it was not that. The problem of Memphis was, was uh, here. That was the problem of Memphis. No, no, no. The difference is, uh, uh, Artemide was uh, the supporter of Memphis. It means uh, Memphis is part, uh, part of uh, Artemide, or was part of Artemide because we understand it's uh, very important to be the first in the industrial design, but also it's important to think about the future, to explore, to, to go around, to find some different way. The result, the final result was, Memphis was a fantastic, incredible, successful, and the change, the, 
the, I said, the image of the design, not the design, the image of the design. The problem is when the company is at the service of the designer, it's difficult to run the company and Memphis is not successful anymore. Artemide, in Artemide, the designer are not in the service <laughs> of the company, but uh, we work together, but it's the service of the company. Because uh, in uh, Artemide, we are thinking about the marketing, uh, products, uh, price, uh, production, and uh, Artemide is still in life. But you see, uh, the, the world of products is enormously varied. And uh, naturally, you can pick out some products where, where the design part is, is so important that you can leave the others uh, somewhere a little bit in the background, fashion, for instance. But, uh, <clears throat> but there are many other products where, where the exterior is just a part of it. And this is what you, what you also said before. In, and in this case, I do not think that design is any, in any way less important than in others. But in order to transform a, a project or a model into a real product, you really need this sort of cooperation that Michele spoke about before. You need to have a, a real team to work together. And this is also, in many cases, the most exciting part of the work of a designer. But this is the more difficult and the more complicated, the bigger the company is that has to, to do this. And the more people are involved in making decisions and having to risk, risk company money or stockholders' money, this is always getting much, much more difficult. And if you are talking to a company which has one boss and he can decide everything. And this is a reason why, if you look at the best uh, industrial design around, this is very often made by small companies, not by big companies. How big is Artemide uh, as a company? We are, uh, in dollar I don't know, I, I have to change it, but it's uh, 150 mi billion uh, around the world. This is the volume of Artemide. We have, lire, lire. What? A lire, million dollars. Not dollars. Ah, lire, lire, not dollars. No. Lire, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> what is it in... Uh, 100 million dollars. 100 million dollars. 150, 100, 100, 100, million, 100 million dollars. Okay. No, it, it's quite interesting for me because uh, this problem of, uh, of the relationships between uh, designers and, and industries are very close to the creativity uh, uh, research because now the change of this kind of re uh, of research is uh, uh, we don't we cannot study only the individual the mind of the individual the creativity is not in the individual but uh, in a very wide uh, uh, context because only the relationships between the creative the individual creativity the f the, f the social and economical forces uh, uh, we can call them the field, uh, the real situation of the society and of, of the economy in, in a certain moment, and on the other side, the symbolic system of the discipline, the state of art, the domain. Only when there is an interaction, ordered interaction, connection between the individual, the single individual creativity, the economic uh, goals, and the state of art of uh, the discipline, in this case design, we can have new, pro new things, new products. The single individual is not enough to produce uh, novelty. They, 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 we must uh, link our creativity with the external forces, the economical and the symbolic one. So this is ver the, the design is a clear example, in my opinion, of this necessity, the three points.
<laughs> Good question. <laughs> you want to bet on it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think we, we, the interesting idea of this product, it, you can have general rules and then to, to give this general framework to available to the creativity of, uh, of, uh, of the single designer. So I, I, I don't know if I can say uh, yes, I agree or not, I agree to your question. But I, I think that the, we can have some general aspect of the light and colors function which can be uh, reached in an easier way to the unconscious, as Richard Sapper said at the beginning of his speech, of the uh, designer. So this is, uh, I think, is the most important uh, goal of the psychological and sociological studies concerning light and colors. Not give us the studies uh, concerning gestalt or perception, try to do, give fixed rules, but give the general uh, uh, framework to help to develop new products and new conceptions. Target was uh, to mix the color together, and the, the most important thing is the stratification. Did you see? It's uh, it's really different. We don't like to have one color or a million color. It's possible to do, but it's more important to create atmosphere. Yes, you, please. This work in uh, mental institutions is very important because of what they do. So I want to commend you. Mm -hmm. But I think it has, Charles Eames talked about it. And the next thing that could happen is some visuals could go with it where you actually see the sun go up or down, you know, in whatever way you want. And uh, it's the closest thing I've seen that we can handle by hand and do it. So I did want to commend the Timothy and all that. And, uh, I didn't come from that point of view. <laughs> I just merely voiced some of the opinions that exist in the world. Um, Excuse yes, me. please. I, I like to <coughs> continue. Uh, this metamorphosis, it's only at the beginning yeah. because we are working. We have many requests. We have many requests about the different application. You said hospital or uh, we have application in conference room, uh, in uh, banks, uh, in uh, hotels. Uh, a room in hotels, uh, you, you, you change your life in the hotel. It's not uh, so dangerous to be there. And uh, uh, we try to, to change the system and to utilize the system in, in different ways. Is, is there a next step? Uh, what is the next step in the product development? Will sizes be smaller? One, one is uh, to make uh, small sizes. Depends on the application of this, if you need more. One other is uh, to do bigger <laughs> sizes. 
because sometimes you need uh, more, more light, uh, um, more watts than this. And the other is uh, to find the application in the window, for example. You don't see here, but you saw in the exhibition when the color are working, you see different effects. It's very good for the window, for the sh uh, fashion shopping, mm -hmm. shopping center. Okay, uh, we are running out of time. There's one last question there. When you showed your 1960 television cube, it didn't it's look like a TV because the picture was off and you said it showed that the TV was on. However, when you said it was a perfectly contained cube, your photographs belied your statement because it was a very ugly antenna sticking out. Did you in your design ever attempt to hide the television within that so-called self-contained cube? No, no, the antenna was a part of it. We were not so radical that we would say, now we hide the antenna. It can be done, can it not? Well, it could have been done, certainly. You don't need an antenna in a, in a TV set. If you have an exterior, exterior antenna, you don't need that. So as a matter of fact, all these antennas are detachable. So if you, for instance, no, would not have liked this antenna sticking out, you just took it off, no problem. But Well, there was no reason to, because you just uh, stick a cable into the into the into the TV set, and you have your antenna. Okay, uh, there's a, okay. One last question, and we're being told to leave. I, I am not a physician, but uh, <laughs> when I was a student, they said the fundamental color are blue, green, and uh, red. So, uh, this is supported also by the physio physiology of seeing. The, the, the uh, cells, the retina cells, are, are pig, uh, sensible to colors, have pig pigments sensible to, the, to these uh, wave lengths, red, blue and, and, and green. Uh, so there, there is a, the three, is this, this is an old theory of trichromatism uh, starting the 18th and uh, 19th century. The, 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 this is, our cells contains pigments sensible to these three fundamental uh, colors. Okay, if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, please do and play with the lamps. Um, thank you for coming, and there is a reception afterwards where you can meet the designers. Thank you.